Uh, good morning. Welcome. Glad that you're here with us this morning at Burnside Christian Church. Um, if you're new with us, I hope that you've been uh, made to feel especially welcome this mor- morning. Um, there was a thank you note that came in after Doug had been up here, and so I just want to take a few minutes and read that to you. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was a group of, of men from this church that went to um, Carol Crum's house and, and helped her out. I said, thanks to the men and boys who gave up their Saturday morning to help clean up my yard. I really appreciate it. Carol Crum. So if you're a part of that crew, thank you so much for, for your service um, to her this morning. Uh, we've been studying for this, this year, we've been in the, um, the Gospel of John all year, and we're going to continue to be there. Um, we're, we're in a series called Genuine Jesus, where we get to see um, who Jesus was, uh, for, um, according to the Gospel of John. And we're going to be in chapter 8, starting in verse 12, so if you want to go ahead and, and turn there this morning. Um, we're going to be there for, for uh, our time together. Um, for the past several weeks, though, of our study, I kind of want to bring you up to the speed with where we are. Um, Jesus has been in Jerusalem uh, for, this, for the Feast of Tabernacles. It's one of the three major feasts in the uh, Jewish religion. Um, it's where they would commemorate um, the, their ancestors living in the wilderness for 40 years. And so they would spend a week in these, these tents, tent-like structures. Um, and, and in this particular story, we find Jesus at the temple uh, doing some teaching. And, and when he's there, he's in this, this court called the Court of Women, it's also known as the Treasury, where people would walk in and they would drop their money, their, their tithes and offerings into some basins there. It was, it was one of the most public places in the temple. So a lot of people would be in this, this area. Typically, this area was reserved for, for Pharisees and, and their disciples. They would do a lot of teaching here. And Jesus kind of moves right in and begins teaching as well, kind of taking over their spot. Um, and no one stopped him uh, at this time, is what the Bible tells us. And so he's there, he's teaching um, day in and day out in the, in the temple um, here. And, and it's kind of where we, we uh, pick up in the story. One thing that you should know as well is that this is where the, the menorah was. And if you didn't know what a menorah is, it's, it's this candle holder that was in the temple that uh, Moses was commanded to create in the tabernacle. Well, this would light up the temple court and light up this, this area where Jesus was. And so he takes this opportunity to teach uh, the, the people that, that were there listening a little bit about who, who he is, using this as um, an object lesson for them. And so in, in verse 12, it says, Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Right? So they, they see this light that's kind of cast around the, the temple, and Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I'm not just the light in Jerusalem. I'm not just the light in the, in the temple here. I'm, a light, I'm the light of the entire world. And he says, the one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so there's a contrast here that Jesus is talking about um, between light and darkness. Uh, light signifies things like knowledge and life. Darkness signifies things like ignorance and death. Light represents truth because it exposes what is actually there. We can see things because the light has been, has, has, is is there and exposes what we couldn't see. Darkness hates the light because it exposes and thereby judges the evil deeds that are done in the darkness. Light represents purity. And we see this theme all throughout Scripture, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. We see, we see this contrast between light and darkness. And throughout the New Testament, we see the, these, these qualities of light personified in, in different areas and in different people. And the first area that we see um, this, this idea personified is, is in the person of God and who God is. We see light personified as God. We see this in, in Psalm 23, when, when the psalmist writes, uh, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because God is with me. Even though I walk in that dark place, God is my light, is what he's saying in that, in that moment. And so we see this also in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, when it says, when John writes, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you. That God is light. God is knowledge. God is truth. God is life. God is pure. And in him, in him, there's no darkness. There is no evil. There is no death at all. So not only do we see this personified in the person of God, but we also see this in Jesus. 
We see this in, in Jesus as the representation of God. Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the exact representation of God. And so we see this in the person of Jesus. In Matthew 4, 12, it is quoting Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. It says, The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. And so while people were sitting in their evil deeds, while people were sitting in, in their sin and, and, and in their death, Jesus came, is what, what Matthew is, is saying, and brought life and hope and a future. Not only in Matthew chapter 4, but we also see this of Jesus in John chapter 1. It says, this was the true light that coming into the world enlightens every person, and this being Jesus in that. We also see this in, in John chapter 3, verse 19. It says, and this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. And so we see this personified as God, we see this personified as Jesus, uh, but the light is also personified in Scripture as Christians, as we are ambassadors of Jesus. Matthew 5.14, Jesus is teaching, and he says, you, referring to his followers, are the light of the world. You are the truth. You are the life. Like you, you are the light of the world. As we are ambassadors for Christ, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. It's also true, we'll see in, in John chapter 12, as we come to that, it says, while you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of the light. And this is what, what Paul is referring back to in 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5, when he says, For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not sons of night nor of darkness. And so we see um, this, this idea of light being personified in God. We see it personified in Jesus, who is the exact representation of God. We see this personified in, in Christians as followers of Jesus, as ambassadors for him. But we also see this idea of light in the gospel as proclaimed by Christians. Acts 26, 23 tells us uh, as to whether the Christ was to suffer and whether as first from the resurrection of the dead, basically summing up the gospel message there that Jesus died and rose from the dead for us, as first from, uh, he would proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. It is saying that the gospel message is the light. Gospel message brings life. It brings um, freedom. It brings knowledge and truth. And it exposes our, our evil deeds. It, it exposes us and brings us out of death and into life. And so there's this competition all throughout Scripture between light and darkness that will ultimately end with the consummation of the kingdom of God. And we see that in Revelation 21 and, and 22. And so when Jesus begins his, this statement saying, I am the light of the world, the Pharisees that are standing around listening understand this to be a messianic language. Understanding this to, to, to mean that Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah. They knew Isaiah 9, they knew Psalm 23, and they see Jesus as making that claim. And so naturally, they challenge him a little bit. Because Jesus doesn't fit into what they think the Messiah should look like. And a lot of times, Jesus doesn't fit into the box that we try to place him into. And, and the same is true here. And so they challenge him. In verse 13, he continues on and says, So the Pharisees said to him, You are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. See, in the Old Testament, it required more than one person to, to, for a truth claim to be made. And Jesus responds to them and says, Even if I am testing, or testifying about myself, my testimony is true. Because I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. But even if I do judge... Um, oh, sorry. Uh, you judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I am the Father who sent me. Even in your law it has been written that the testimony of two people is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testi testifies about me. Like I said, the Old Testament requires um, witnesses to such a claim. But the Pharisees, time and time again, had rejected those witnesses that Jesus has pointed to. 
Jesus pointed to prophecy that was spoken about him long ago. He pointed to the message of John the Baptist. He, he even um, pointed to, to the works that he was doing and the miracles that he did. But the Pharisees continued to reject those accounts. Uh, when looking at um, his miracles, they, they claimed that he was a son of Beelzebub in Matthew 12, saying that he had demonic power. And so what is left? What else can Jesus point to? They refuse to listen uh, to Jesus, and since that is the case, Jesus refuses to walk that road again. Uh, he, he, since God had given the prophets as witnesses, including John the Baptist, and the works of Jesus that, that um, proved his words were true, and the life that he gave, what other witnesses did Jesus need to provide? And you know, sometimes I feel like it's hard for us to even see Jesus working. And I, that's what's happening here. The Pharisees are having a hard time seeing Jesus' work at hand. And I think sometimes it's hard for us to see that in our own lives. Sometimes we're going through, through different things and we, we want God to, to show us a sign. Give us a sign that he's true. That we want him to, to act in a certain way. And forgetting that he's been faithful in the past. And if he's faithful in the past, he's going to be faithful into the future. And only Jesus can testify to his origin, to his unity with God, and it's shown through the consistency in his message. See, Jesus is saying that, that they judge superficially, according to appearances, and, then, and those are not suitable ways to judge for spiritual truth. And I feel like we do the same thing sometimes. We judge based upon what we see or what we think we know. I mean, don't we judge other action, others' actions based upon how we think we would respond to that situation? Don't we judge uh, based upon our own expectations, failing to understand the whole picture of what's happening? Sometimes I feel like we just need to take a step back, kind of get over ourselves a little bit, and begin looking at things the way that God looks at things, and begin looking at people the way that God looks at people. The Pharisees had, had their minds set on earthly things, like we so often do. They refused to listen to Jesus, and since they don't really know the Father, they have no way to receive the testimony of Jesus. Jesus is making it very clear in, in this passage that he is the only way to God. But since they cut off Jesus, uh, Mark Moore puts it this way, that they have burned the, every bridge out of the shadow of death. Because Jesus is that bridge. He is the only way. All that is left at this point is judgment and death because Jesus came to preach salvation. He didn't come to preach judgment. John 3.16 and 17 tells us that, that Jesus came for salvation, not for condemnation. But in the process of that, when he was preaching for, for life and, and for salvation, there are parameters set around who will and, and will not be saved. Jesus wasn't here to judge, but his words do judge. And he continues on in verse 21. He says, then he said again to them, I'm going away. And you will look for me and you will die in your sin. And where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says... Uh, where I am going, you cannot come. They were kind of confused here because um, the only place that Jesus could go where they couldn't go is, would be to die. And Jesus obviously isn't referring to, to, um, uh, to, to suicide in this, in this manner. He's referring back to, to the cross. And so Jesus says, you're going to search for me and you're not going to find me. Well, well, what does that mean? And scholars have said multiple different things. And I want to lay out two scenarios for you. The first is potentially at the fall of Jerusalem. See, in AD 70, with a city surrounded by Rome, Jerusalem would fall after a terrible um, siege that would take place. And Jesus alludes to this in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, Jesus is saying, at that time, people are going to say, the Christ is over here and the Christ is over here. And Jesus says, don't listen to them. They're saying, there's a deliverer over here that's going to that's going to deliver us from the hand of Rome, and Jesus is saying, "Don't listen to them. I'm not going to be there at all." And I think sometimes we look for for earthly deliverance in our own lives and in the issues that we're facing. We look for for an earthly salvation in in politics. Regardless of, of who the person is, sometimes we, we want them to, to just be in, in office because um, they're going to go with what our agenda is. So we look to a political saving. Sometimes when we're dealing with afflictions, we look to an earthly salvation and, and healing through doctors. Far too often we're looking for those, but, but the, there's no earthly solution to our sins, to our oppression, to our afflictions. The second would be the Messiah himself. 
See, they cannot find the Messiah because they've already rejected him in Jesus. They're, they're looking for an earthly kingdom again, rather than a spiritual one, and they would not find what they're looking for in that. And so Jesus says, you're going to look for things, and you're not going to find it because you're looking for the wrong thing. You cannot find me in that. In verse 23, he continues on, it says, He was saying to them, You are from below, and I am from above. You are of this world, and I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And that, that I am statement has come up all throughout Scripture. right? That's, that's how God introduces himself to Moses. Uh, he, says, he says, I am that I am. He says, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. They would not find Jesus because they're from two different worlds. And Jesus is the only way to the Father. There's only one way to forgiveness, and that is through Jesus. We cannot come to know God except through Jesus. And he makes it clear in this passage. And he makes their sins kind of the grounds of separation between him and the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees are separated by their, their origin and their nature. Ours, ours is a sinful nature. And Jesus explains that, unless, uh, that we will die unless we are delivered through our faith in him. And you know, on a, on a day like today, we talk a lot about freedom. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to spare you some of the, the details as far as freedom in the scripture because I think Wayne did an excellent job um, during communion kind of pointing those out. We talk a lot about freedom, and, and, and rightly so. We celebrate the freedoms that we have in, in this country, and we should celebrate those. But true freedom only comes in and through the person of Jesus Christ. True freedom only comes through Jesus. It does not come uh, through, through politics. It does not come through a doctor. It, the healing that we need is not a physical healing. It's a spiritual one that we need. And so the only way to not die in our sins is to have the light of the world in our lives. And in verse 25, then they were saying to him, who are you? Jesus said, you know, unless you believe in, in who I am, you're going to die in your sins. And they're like, well, who are you? And Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? I don't know if you've ever been in a conversation with somebody where, where you've tried to explain to them something and they're just not getting it. And maybe you've, you've spent a significant amount of time and you've been talking at them for, for a long time and they ask you a question when you're done that basically you just tried to answer. You ever been there, right? And how annoying that can be at times. I remember um, in Bible college, we were sitting in, in philosophy class and uh, my wife Sarah uh, was, was in that class with us and, and we had the, these group projects where groups had to get up in front of the class and teach a section of philosophy to the rest of the class, um, which was awful, uh, to be honest with you, because the, a lot of times the, the speaker didn't know what they were teaching and neither did the students. Well, this particular time, Sarah's teaching on natural philosophy um, and, and she gets through her, her, her teaching time and there's a student that raises their hand in the back and asks a question. And, and I don't even know what, the, what she was talking about. I don't remember the question. But the professor turned around and, and he said, she just answered that and then moved on, right? That's what's happening here. Jesus is like, I've been telling you who I am from the very beginning. Like, I've been telling you through all the interactions that we've had up, to the, up, up through the book of John that we're reading so far. He says, you should know who I am. I've been telling you this from the beginning. Jesus is, is simply boldly calling the Pharisees to believe in him. Jesus has already addressed who he was as the son of God by using words like, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. And they would have understood those statements as messianic statements. And yet they still weren't grasping what Jesus was saying. And in verse 26, Jesus says, I have many things to say to you and to judge regarding you. But he who sent me is true, and the things which I heard from him, these I say to the world. They did not realize that he was speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. And I do nothing on my own, but I say these things as the Father instructed me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. 
And so they misunderstand the words of God, and, and in doing so, eventually it's going to lead to the crucifixion of Jesus. And looking back on his life, they might see that his soul had no bitterness towards them, that what he said was true, and that he was, in fact, from the Father. And, and we see this in the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when it says over 3,000 came to be believers in that, in that moment and were baptized by Peter and the other followers. But for now, Jesus is simply going to let God speak for him. See, we don't always have to defend the truth. Well, we, we can let God do that. We're to speak the truth, as Jesus is doing here, in order to, to reconcile others back to God, in order to pave a, the way for that to happen without judgment from us, because God is the judge of all. Jesus is, not, is choosing not to judge here. He's saying, I could judge you, but I'm not going to because that's not my job in this. We are to be ambassadors, making it possible for others to come to an understanding of the depth of the love that God has for his people, longing to bring them back to himself. And sometimes we get in the way of this through our words that we have towards others and the attitudes that we show to others. Sometimes our words and our actions can do more harm than good. We must remember that we are called to plead with people to be reconciled to God, but not judge them when they don't choose to do so. And it's so easy to fall into that trap of judgment. In order to keep from doing it, it requires um, both the incarnation of Jesus, the person of Jesus, the light of the world in our lives, but also the renewing of our minds. We have to begin to think differently about the world and about people. We need to begin thinking more like God thinks. We must stop thinking with earthly thoughts and begin thinking with heavenly thoughts. See, Jesus has already revealed himself to them, but they couldn't understand because they were still thinking in earthly terms, not in heavenly ones. And Mark Moore tells us that Jesus' submission to the cross is the ultimate demonstration of the obedience and unity with the Father. Jesus says, you're going to lift me up. And he's, return, referring back to, he's referring forward to the cross. And so Jesus' submission is the ultimate demonstration of his obedience and unity with the Father. And likewise, our submission to the cross. You know, Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So our submission to the cross is our ultimate demonstration of obedience and unity with God. Verse 29, he says, And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Our submission and our obedience is what is pleasing to God. And this is what Paul boasts about in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says, I affirm, brothers and sisters, by the boasting in which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, that I die daily. The only way to get the light of the world into our life, in order, the only way to have, to have knowledge and truth and life and to, to overcome the evil deeds that we do is to die to ourselves. And we have to do that daily. And as a result of that, as a result of what Jesus just, just spoke about, people understand, begin to understand that, that, that he is the only way to the Father. Many came to believe in him. And some have argued that, that, that this isn't a saving faith, that maybe it's just kind of a mental ascent, that they, okay, Jesus is kind of who he is, but doesn't change their life. I don't know if this was just a, simply a saving faith or, or just a, a step in the right direction. But the truth is that, that faith is a journey. It's not a simply a one-time, single decision that we make. It's a journey full of, of highs and lows. When I was in college, I, I had the opportunity to work at a summer camp, and one of the weeks that we were there, we, we took junior high students on a, um, a three-day hike where we would carry you know, all of our food and all of our supplies. Uh, and I mean, taking junior, highs, junior high students on that, it was like herding cats at times, right? Um, but, but I learned a lot uh, on that trip. One of the first things we account, encountered was um, one of the girls kind of had some issues to where she could no longer carry her, her backpack. And so one of the other leaders and I um, threw her backpack on our backs. And so we would carry our packs and we'd carry hers along with it. And then a little bit later, we'd switch back and forth to get through the other few days um, of this trip because, you know, you have a starting destination, you got to get to the end. It was full of moments where you're, you're walking up from some pretty steep hills and you're going down. It's full of joys where, where we would get to Lake Superior and we'd be able to go swimming in, in the lake and feel refreshed. Or we'd come across some wild berries and pick those and, and eat those. 
In fact, one moment we were walking along a trail and realized we were on the wrong trail. And so we had to turn back around and go and find where we were supposed to go. And faith is a lot like that. It's a journey. Sometimes we get lost. Sometimes we're worn down. Sometimes we, we just need somebody to come alongside us and, and, and help carry our burden. And sometimes we need to come alongside others and help carry their burdens as well. And Paul writes in Philippians 3.14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Faith is a journey, but it's one that we must press on forward in. Faith is a journey, but it begins with a step. Faith is a journey that begins with a step. And so the question is, what is your step in your journey? Where are you at in your journey? Uh, perhaps today you need to take that step and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you need to walk into the waters of baptism and declare that truth in your life today. Maybe you've wandered off the path and you need to rediscover who Jesus is. Perhaps you've been here for a while and you want to declare publicly that you belong to this body here at Burnside Christian Church. Maybe your, your next step is to, is to begin serving in an area of ministry and need here at the church. VBS is a great opportunity to start doing that. See, we all have different places and, different, and we're all at different points on our own journeys in faith. Headed towards the same goal and that's in a relationship with Jesus. So whatever decision you need to make, whatever step you need to take, we encourage you to, to come forward. As the praise team is going to come back forward, we're going to sing a song of decision at this time. Will you pray with me?